In 1970, I, I was very tired from too many late nights and too many drugs and all the rest of it. So, and so like a lot of people, I, I sort of dropped out for a while and went to live on Allen Ginsberg's hippie commune in upstate New York. And one of the things that Ginsberg was very, very interested in was basically 60s gossip. And he just loved to hear all the stories about the Beatles and the Stones and, you know, the whole sort of underground scene in London. Um, and he kept saying, write it down, write it down, because he, he loved the stories I was telling him. So I actually got some journals and uh, filled two or three volumes, uh, handwritten journals, trying to remember everything I could from that period, which, of course, then was still only a, a year or two ago. So back then I could still remember what George Martin's wife was wearing at a dinner party at Paul McCartney's or something like that, which, of course, 50 years later you can't remember. So um, that's what I did, and I filled those um, hundreds and hundreds of pages. John Dunbar and Peter Asher and myself started uh, the Indica Bookshop and Gallery. John was married to Marianne Faithful at the time, and uh, she was pregnant um, during when we were very first starting the shop. So uh, there was a strange division within um, their house, uh, with John and his friends also sitting in the living room, smoking dope and generally carrying on, banging on pots and pans and uh, being typical 60s hippies. And then in the back, there was uh, the Baroness Arissa, and, uh, which is Marianne Faithful's mother, and the nanny, and Marianne, and the baby, of course. And there were two completely different lifestyles going on, one very, very straight and bourgeois, and the other one very, very bohemian and uh, subversive. And uh, it, was, it was very, very funny to just move between the two, as indeed uh, people did. I mean, the Baroness, for instance, was a notorious cigarette stealer, and she would... Uh, come through to the front, and in those days I often could only afford like a packet of ten cigarettes, not even a, pack, a full pack, and she'd say, I'll be your cigarette, and you you very reluctantly offer her some, and she would take half the pack. <laughs> it was, you know, everyone, you know, as soon as she came in the room, everyone was like trying to hide, you know, but uh, there you go. That was, uh, it was, it was a very strange scene, very funny. There, there was one, there was one dinner party there when Marianne cooked, uh, I remember it was a, it was a ham studded with cloves. It was a beautiful job. And, uh, of course, we all sat around smoking and getting out of it. And uh, it got later and later. And she was really irritated and apparently uh, ran off and went over to, to her mother's to tell her mother how horrible uh, John was. And then she thought, you know, she was getting a bit hungry and, and came back. And of course, nobody had noticed that she'd gone at all. So she sort of reheated the, the ham and brought it in, and we all thought it was absolutely fantastic. It was all a big accident, really, how I got to meet all these people. Uh, of course, I had the advantage of going to art school, and that was what changed so many of the people of my generation. We, it didn't necessarily produce that many great artists, but it produced an awful lot of good rock and rollers and, and people with... Uh, a changed cultural viewpoint, should we say. <laughs> and I was one of them. Um, I mean, I did, did start off as a painter, but uh, I, I wasn't any good. So basically, um, I'm, I moved more into, into book selling and writing. And eventually, of course, decided to be a writer, but not for quite a long time. I didn't write my first serious book till I was about 40 or something. Um, but uh, it was a pure set of accidents entirely.